my friends and colleagues for many years. Um, Haifa Shen is going to give um, a talk today about um, some of um, his recent work on um, overcoming transport barriers and some of the recent drug delivery work. Uh, Haifa is a professor of nanomedicine um, and um, a, a also affiliated with um, YL Cornell Medical College. His uh, primary appointment is as a member of the Research Institute at the Houston Methodist. He obtained his um, a medical degree in China and then uh, came over to US where he obtained his PhD degree in 1997 um, from the University of Texas at Houston and MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center. Um, after um, continuing on and doing a stint at the National Cancer Institute. Um, he entered the pharma world and uh, he was a drug development scientist there until 2010 where he rejoined academia. Um, and um, he's done incredibly well since then. Um, his current research is on basically developing a lot of different types of treatments for cancer. And his uh, research team has um, developed many different types of work, which are very interesting. And we're very excited um, to hear about um, Dr. Shen's work today. And uh, with that said, um, please take it away, um, Haifa. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kadam Hassani. Um, thank, uh, 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 well, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to present uh, my work at the, the Terizaki Institute seminar. As uh, uh, Dr. Um, Kalam Hosseini said, uh, that uh, my work is on um, drug delivery. So when I was uh, preparing uh, this uh, seminar, um, the professor, uh, Dr. Meiji, told me try to be broad because we want to cover a broad uh, audience. So um, I have made a new slide deck instead of talking about how drug molecules can kill cancer cells or signal transduction pathways or cancer developed mechanism. I'm going to present some general ideas on drug delivery. Now, um, you guys want, uh, um, I wonder why drug delivery? As uh, Dr. Kadem Hussain said, I came back from the biopharma industry 10 years ago. I was uh, leading a cancer drug development uh, group in the industry, so we, where we identified many small molecule compounds that could kill cancer cells in petri dish very well with high potency. However, when we put the compound in live animals with the tumors, uh, they did, uh, most of them did nothing. So that was a very frustrating and they told us that yeah, the compound was not working inside the body. Uh, now we know after uh, many years that there exists so many physical and, uh, pharma, uh, physical and biological barriers at the both the systemic level and the local level that the block uh, drug transport. And uh, my work since then has been trying to negotiate with uh, these transport uh, uh, um, barriers and uh, to send uh, as uh, much drugs as possible to, to the disease organ. Now, here's an, a, a cartoon that I found uh, um, on, uh, in the internet. It was uh, most likely from uh, 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 Professor Rakesh Jain in Harvard Medical School. It shows that the, uh, uh, there is a tumor, and uh, these are the blood vessels inside the tumor and outside. And you can see the blood vessels inside the tumor are totally different from the uh, uh, nearby uh, tissues. And it was these, uh, uh, the, the structure of the tissues and the flow. Um, through dynamics that, that are pro, um, prohibiting drug uh, from entering uh, the tissue. And uh, this was one of the first uh, experiments I did uh, um, coming back from, uh, uh, back to the academia where we put a mouse with a tumor under a, 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 an inch wider microscope. And when we we uh, focused that tumor, as you can see that the uh, 
uh, although the tumor, uh, there are lots of blood vessels in the tumor, there were not that much blood supplies in the tumor tissue. Then we in inject the uh, um, fluorescent, uh, green fluorescent dye uh, into the mouse through tail vein injection and uh, monitor uh, the, the accumulation of the blue fluorescent dye. As you can see, they, they could reach to the edge of the tumor, but not so much inside the tumor, indicating that there is a problem. Now, uh, back uh, five years ago, uh, we uh, propose that, that in order for the drug molecules or drug particles, no matter whether it's formulated or not, to reach the, the tumor tissue, so you need to design these uh, uh, formulations correctly so that these uh, drug molecules or drug particles, uh, they should not uh, be captured by the, the filtering organs such as a liver and a spleen, they, they can, uh, should not go to uh, the, these non-relevant organs uh, due to non-specific uh, distribution. They should not be pushed by the, uh, the circulating cells to the edge of the, uh, of the blood vessel so that they have a smooth flow in the uh, normal blood vessel. But once they, they reach the tumor tissue, then they still need to overcome a bunch of other problems. For example, the interstitial uh, for the pressure inside the uh, tumor is higher than in the blood vessel, which uh, creates some problem. Now, once inside the tumor, the drug still can be either be destroyed in the endosome last some pathway, or, or they can be pumped out. So a drug should uh, be designed with all these capabilities to overcome these kind of barriers. So over the years, in my lab, in my lab we have used a different technology platform to deliver drug, uh, regardless of the, uh, the, the uh, silicon-based particles or liposome-based particles or, or, or some other particulated drugs. And then we have applied these uh, uh, platforms uh, to, to treat the uh, uh, mouse with a, with a tumor, with a metastasis tumor, with a, a primary tumor. And, uh, and then we, we have uh, applied both uh, big molecule, uh, macromolecules, uh, small molecules, uh, and RNA-based drugs. So our idea is simple. So in, in order for um, cancer, therapy to work, you, you need to mobilize any kind of therapeutics, regardless of uh, molecules or, or even T cells these days. You need to make them move, make them go to the places uh, where, where they need to be. And here uh, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Now the, the first uh, uh, platform we use are called the Puro Silicon. Uh, microparticles. Uh, these microparticles were designed with a uh, 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 specific uh, size, shape, uh, and the surface modification combination. So uh, these uh, particles tend to go to the tumor tissue and attach the tumor vasculature, where uh, they, they release the, uh, the drug load, but, but they do not attach to the normal blood vessels so easily. Now, uh, in our design, we, we load these uh, uh, nano pools of the procyclic particle with uh, polymeric drugs. Now, uh, the, the, the yellow strings indicate the polymers and the red dots indicate the drug molecule. So uh, once uh, uh, this, uh, this whole package into uh, the body and uh, uh, the, the whole thing got attached to the tumor blood vessel where these polymer drugs get uh, contact with the aqueous solution water mainly, and they self-assemble into nanoparticles in, uh, at, the, at the opening area of the nanopool. And what, uh, after that, this nanoparticle would leave and then the, the next one will form and uh, one, uh, uh, they, again and again and again that create a sustained release platform. How does that work? 
the, in, uh, here a uh, um, uh, couple of uh, intro water uh, images uh, where we loaded the porosilicon microparticle with the polymeric doxorubicin. As you can see, the doxorubicin uh, molecules are red. So once they form nanoparticles, they become red and they, they, they escape from the, uh, the nanopores. Now the gray areas are the porosilicon and the orange area are the polymeric drugs before they form nanoparticles. If you, you put these uh, uh, macroparticles in, in water and then you, you can capture the release image. I'm not going to show you uh, uh, the videos of particle release uh, uh, for fear that I, it's going to crash my computer. But I can promise you that there is a, a sustained release uh, pattern. We applied uh, this uh, a drug that we call the IMPG PDOX uh, to treat uh, a mouse with uh, a lung metastasis with a breast uh, cancer. And then um, several hours after uh, uh, the um, injection, by tailwind injection, we uh, euthanized the animals and uh, uh, took the uh, uh, metastatic lens. Here are s uh, some of the uh, um, histological analysis. As you can see, uh, here is a one uh, or two red blood cells. Uh, here are some of the particles indicating they are in the blood vessel. And if you, you go uh, deeper to the tumor bearing area, and then, then you can see that. Uh, the, the brown ones are the uh, tumor vasculature, and then you can see these particles got attached to the tumor vessel. If you brew them up, here, uh, um, here's a one TM image. You, you can see the, here's a, a blood vessel, a micro vessel with a red blood cells. And here is a one piece of the particle. Uh, the particle got the, uh, captured by the tumor uh, uh, vascular in the cilia cell. It's a, it's a very tight interaction. It's that place that the, um, the porous uh, silicon uh, microparticles release the polymeric uh, doxorubicin nanoparticle. And in a recent uh, work, we have sh sh uh, applied PET-CT to to, to capture these images, we, we can uh, go to the live animal to find where these uh, particles go in this air, uh, case. The, uh, the green ones are the tumor cells labeled with the EGFP, and uh, the, uh, the red ones are actually some of the particles and uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, um, oh, actually the, the pink ones are the particles particles, uh, no, I'm sorry, the red ones are the particles and the pink ones are released the polymeric doxorubicin uh, drugs there. Um, well, by the end of the day, we uh, uh, performed the uh, uh, efficacy study uh, with a bunch of uh, controls, um, the phosphor, uh, 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 for selling the IMPG, PDOX, that's the poor silicon microparticle alone. Uh, the free doxorubicin and the liposomal doxorubicin, these are the two uh, FDA approved drugs for the treatment of metastatic breast cancer. And then we uh, have the, the, the polymeric doxorubicin nanoparticle as control. And then finally, it's our drug based on, on both on the imaging and the, based on the Kaplan Meyer plot. You can see that uh, most of the controls did not help much. Um, uh, uh, the animals treated with uh, the liposomal doxorubicin or dox doxil extended the uh, survival by um, a few weeks uh, as expected as a dox doxil is not a very efficacious drug. In, uh, in uh, contrast, in our, uh, animals were treated with IMPG PDOX, that's the, um, the, the test drug, they survived much longer and 50% of animals, they, they were cured of, of tumor. 
Now, even for these that die, uh, still died uh, um, weeks or months later, they actually died of uh, a brain metastasis instead of lung metastasis. Uh, anyway, by the end of the day, all, um, in, in most of the animals uh, in this treatment group, uh, the, uh, they were cured of lung metastasis. So um, we, after this uh, work, we, we submit a grant to the Department of Defense, uh, and we propose that the uh, IMPGP docs is a good uh, drug, is an efficacious drug uh, with a low toxicity. We should uh, promote the drug uh, from bench to the better side. So DOD liked the, uh, the project and uh, they, they funded us with $16 million um, for, for the quality uh, development. Boy, now the GMP manufacturer is actually a completely different ball game. Uh, it's, a, it's a teamwork effort and everyone needs to follow standard of protocol um, very closely. There are lots of uh, quality control and uh, quality in, uh, assurance work. And uh, here is one image of the guys working in our GMP facility. And uh, here are uh, the the images of uh, uh, in the process of poor silicon micro uh, particle fabrication. By the end of the day, we we uh, were able to produce a large amount of uh, drugs for uh, uh, and the enabling studies uh, here. Uh, uh, the, the borders with uh, um, IMPG PDOX inside these, these borders uh, were after lyophilization. And uh, here is a one a final product that we used for, for, for the rat and the monkey study. Well, the success of um, the IMPG PDOX work uh, uh, provide us uh, uh, lots of opportunity for, for the future. Uh, Study. So we recently um, started uh, an IMPG PDOX initiative. As, as you can uh, appreciate that uh, these uh, porosilicon microparticles, can, they can be loaded with, uh, with uh, uh, polymeric doxorubicin. They can be loaded with uh, any other drugs. They can be loaded with uh, uh, other polymeric drugs, as a, uh, 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 even protein uh, drugs or, or also certain other regions, they can also be loaded with uh, diagnostic imaging agents. And that uh, you know, provides uh, opportunities uh, for treatment of cancer, for cardiovascular disease, for inflammatory disease, regenerative medicine, and, and uh, lots of others. So we are in, in the middle of the process and um, both, uh, there, are, there are lots of uh, interest, uh, both from the academia and uh, from the pharmaceutical industry. So we are uh, talking to, to uh, multiple parties in this area. Now, this uh, platform is good, but uh, uh, over time we found that not every organ is accessible. Not every tumor bearing tissue is accessible by the MPG uh, um, uh, PDOX or, or MPG PX drugs. One of these areas is uh, a bone marrow. Um, but bone marrow is actually a, a very uh, uh, important uh, uh, tissue for a, a, a drug targeting because it's the uh, uh, it's the origin of uh, leukemia. It's the origin of a bunch of uh, hematopoietic diseases. It is also a, a sanctuary area for the solid tumor uh, cells before they they metastasize to distant organ. For example, uh, in order for the breast cancer cells to metastasize to to the uh, uh, liver, to the lung, to, to the brain. Um, it, it has been reported that the, uh, the certain cells, uh, they, they uh, first of all will exit the primary tumor and then stay in the bone marrow alone where uh, they, they prepare them, themselves for the future metastasis. So that was a, a good interest for us to, to uh, deliver drug to the bone marrow. 
So uh, we found uh, uh, one property of uh, uh, the uh, uh, tumor blood vessel, which is uh, most of the tumor blood vessel, uh, the tissues are inflamed. The, so the tumor tissues uh, would uh, secrete the uh, inflammatory cytokines, and these cytokines would uh, stimulate the, the blood vessel uh, endothelial cell to overexpress one protein called E-selectin. So we 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 developed a DNA-based uh, abdomen uh, called E-selectin abdomen. Now we, we may uh, modify certain uh, nucleoside to, to make it very stable. And then we use this abdomen to, to uh, target the, the bone marrow blood vessel uh, where the, the tumor located. Now here um, is one actually standing of, of the bone marrow, uh, the, the tumor is nearby. As you can see, there are a bunch of cells uh, with uh, a blood vessel. The, the vessel uh, walls will stand uh, light. And if you use um, an anti-e-selecting antibody to uh, do the standing, and then you can see they are uh, stand in green. And then we use the e-selecting abdomen to conjugate our nanoparticles. And our nanoparticles are in red now. You can see these the nano or microparticles. They, they stay together with the, the, the uh, blood vessel. Uh, you, if you, uh, you, you brew the, um, oh, well, uh, if you, 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 uh, you take an overall look of the, the bone, you can, uh, here I have uh, a two, a piece of tissues, uh, both adjacent to the big bone. One is inside the bone marrow, and the one is outside the bone. This this area is the the bone. Now uh, you can see quite different pattern. In this case, the uh, the uh, blood vessel endothelial cells was uh, stand in in green, and the, the nanoparticles were in red. Outside the bone. These nan red nanoparticles stay pretty much stay inside the blood vessel, while inside the bone marrow, where uh, the the tumor uh, tissue, is, you can see that the uh, certain uh, nanoparticles they stay inside the blood vessel, while others they have escaped, which indicates that these. Uh, is selecting cell optimal conjugate nanoparticles. They uh, carry the drug particles to the tumor bearing um, area inside the bone marrow, uh, where the, the particles will bind is selecting on the surface of the endothelial cells. Then after that, they exit the blood vessel and then they into the perivascular area. And he has a, an, um, one um, slide to show um, the drug uh, release from uh, uh, the, the, the particles. Uh, uh, forget, uh, well, forgive me here, the, the color is a little bit different. Uh, I've converted the red dots to the green here. Uh, uh, and then the release the drugs were actually in red, as you can see. The one one uh, drug particle would cover uh, a big area, as uh, indicated by by the red uh, fluorescence um, uh, that are inside the cells. Uh, here, the the blue ones are the uh, depistin nuclei. How does the system work? So we have applied the system to to uh, uh, test the uh, several. Uh, Animal model. He, this is a one experiment that I uh, uh, did in collaboration with uh, Monica Guzman in Wild Cornell Medical College in New York. Many, Monica was uh, working on uh, leukemia stem cells, and uh, she found uh, one natural um, compound called uh, um, pasinoid uh, or PTL. She found that if, if you put the PTL, the, uh, the natural compound in petri dish, 
with a, a leukemia stem cell, then this compound can kill the leukemia stem cell very well. However, if you, you just inject this drug by tailwind injection into the mice, uh, three times per day, seven days a week, here in, uh, she did three weeks, that's a lot of injections and it costs a lot of drug with a total dosage of uh, 6,300 milligram per kilogram. The animals did not do not anything. So there, uh, by the end of the day, there were still lots of leukemia stem cells there. So what we did was to load the PTL into our nanoparticles. So instead of uh, injecting three times a day, seven days a week, we in, uh, treat the animals once every two weeks. So in other words, in, in the three weeks, we only gave the animals two injections with a, a total dosage of 2.5 milligram per kilogram instead of uh, 6,300. And, uh, and Monica did the, the uh, leukemia stem cell analysis. So uh, uh, the way she did the, the stem cell um, activity assay is by uh, engraftment after the treatment. In other words, uh, the animals were treated with, with the drug, then she would get the bone marrow uh, cells and then inject the bone marrow cells into na naive animals to see uh, the, the percentage of in, uh, leukemia engraftment. Uh, uh, so in, in this case, whether you treat it with uh, the original animals with a PBS or, or control, or even put the PTL in my cells, there was no difference. In our case, if, if we treat the animals um, once every two weeks, and then there was a significant, significant reduction in percentage of in, in, in graphene, indicating that the, our drug was very successful in killing the leukemia stem cell. Now I'm going to switch gear to, to talk about a second uh, program. So uh, during uh, the study, we found that um, um, certain tr uh, nanoparticles can be effectively uh, captured uh, by the, the dendritic cell, which is the professional antigen presenting cell. If you give them uh, yeah, in, uh, uh, intravenous, so whether it's a uh, tail vein injection or, or tail vein infusion. And then the um, porosilicon particle happened to be uh, one of these particles. And uh, we found that, that uh, not only these uh, dendritic cells capture these particles, but um, the, uh, sil the porosilicon particle with uh, uh, the, the right uh, uh, physical chemical combination would um, fire up the uh, dendritic cell. As, as you know, dendritic cells, they, by the name, they, they, they will form dendrons after they are stimulated. In this case, uh, you can see this dendritic cell uh, will, will have, uh, take, uh, has taken up uh, uh, multiple particles and they, they got activated. So by um, Functional assay, we know that the dendritic cells uh, secreted the type 1 interference, the interference alpha and the beta, uh, and then also the uh, RANTIS or, or CCL5, which is downstream of uh, interference uh, beta. And uh, later on, we know that uh, what happened was uh, these particles were actually uh, activated the TRIF and the malware pass pathways. So we thought that, that the, the, these uh, um, nanoparticles can serve as a nice uh, uh, adjuvant for cancer vaccine development. So in this case, we prepare the cancer vaccines and we uh, inoculate the tumor bearing mass. Here the circle in, indicates the tumor uh, area. We inject them in, uh, in uh, um, intradermally in the palm, and we, we monitor uh, the, the migration or the carryover of the, um, the radio label, the nanoparticles by the immune cells. Initially, you, you can see that uh, these, uh, cell, uh, uh, these particles will get to the popliteal lymph node, which is the draining lymph node. 
and then later on they move up and uh, up gradually they, they will go to the tumors and go to certain other air, uh, areas like uh, like uh, the spring and even the, the cervical lymph node. So this uh, looks very well. Then we use the, this uh, vaccine platform to, to uh, treat the mouse with uh, HER2 positive breast cancer. You know, HER2 positive breast cancer represents 20 to 30% uh, of total breast cancers, uh, cases in humans and uh, they are uh, although there are certain drugs like Herceptin or, or TDM1, uh, but uh, pa uh, lots of patients still develop uh, metastasis, especially brain metastasis. So there's a good need to develop a, a novel treatment, new treat effective treatment for her to positive breast cancer. In this case, we, we uh, uh, load the, uh, the P66, which is a HER2 specific antigen peptide into our porosilica uh, microparticles and, uh, and put them in, uh, into DC to make a, a dangerous cell vaccine. And then we uh, measured uh, the uh, percentage of uh, antigen specific T cells in CDA. Now here we, we stand the cells with CDA. We also stand the cells with a pentamer, which recognize uh, P66 specific um, antigen on, on the surface. As you can see in the controls, there was not much. If we put the antigen into the post particle without dangerous cells, there was some amount of uh, antigen specific T cell. If you, you it, uh, did not use uh, the, the uh, particle adjuvant, just uh, uh, incubate uh, the then you see with the peptide, there was some certain effect. But if you, you put them together uh, to make a, a dangerous cell vaccine, there were almost 12% of uh, the, the total CDA T cells being antigen specific T cell. We also use another antigen as a control, it's a TRP1, which is a melanoma specific antigen. Of course, uh, the uh, her two specific uh, uh, pentama uh, did not recognize a melanoma antigen. So, so uh, this is a, a background. It tells that uh, uh, the uh, vaccine actually can potently stimulate um, proliferation of antigen specific T cells. Then we use this dangerous cell vaccine to, to treat mouse with HER2 positive breast cancer. As uh, expected, the uh, dangerous cell vaccine worked very well in inhibiting primary HER2 positive breast cancer. While the, the partial vaccines did uh, uh, some work, but uh, the, uh, the result was uh, uh, not as complete as our dangerous cell vaccine. Well, that was good. Uh, based on, on this result, uh, we, we, uh, we thought, well, since the, uh, the angiotic cell vaccine can help to uh, promote um, the vaccine particle transport, uh, and after vaccination, these, uh, these animals uh, got the uh, tumor infected T cells, antigen specific T cells, then we thought, well, the, uh, the, the cancer immune therapy you know, with the vaccine is actually a transport problem. So we thought, well, we, uh, we, with our experience, we can identify the ways to mobilize the vaccine to the lymph node. We can help the vaccine and the T cells interact to generate T cells. And when, later on, we can help the T cells to, to exit the lymph node and go to uh, the tumor bearing organ. So if, if we, we can find all the details and we can facilitate the process, then we can make a cancer immune therapy work more efficiently. So um, a few years ago, we made a proposal to the, to the uh, National Cancer and, uh, Institute and 
they like the idea and uh, we, we got a U54 center grant. Now we, we call it the Center for Immunotherapeutic Transport Oncophysics. So in this center, uh, we work with uh, uh, basic scientists and clinicians. We work with uh, uh, people with um, uh, mathematical background, physics background, material science background, chemistry background uh, in, 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 the, in the center. So uh, there are two projects and, uh, and one core in the, uh, where I'm leading the project one where we, we study the uh, transport of, of the uh, cancer vaccine and the Rolf Breaker and the Eugene Koi, uh, they, they lead an effort to study the T cell infiltration into the tumor and then we have a transport core. Uh, and uh, and we, we have uh, uh, developed uh, uh, multiple collaborations uh, with uh, uh, other centers in the, uh, in the nation. They are, they are uh, in total 10 U54 centers. The, the U54 centers were, were labeled with, uh, with the blue. And there are also the U1 centers uh, of, of the um, uh, program. And we, we have uh, been working very closely with our collaborators. And, uh, and, uh, and well, since I'm the PI of the center, so I've been you know, also involved in the activities that the center organize a quarterly uh, meetings as uh, most of the uh, time scientific meeting. Here is uh, just one event we, we had in last December where we had a joint meeting with the radiation oncology division uh, in, in the MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, uh, where uh, the, the scientists uh, would uh, present uh, the, uh, the data and uh, forge uh, collaborations. With, uh, and we, we also work very closely with, uh, with uh, yeah, the patient advocates uh, to, to promote our research. Here is Anne, Anne she, she is a case patient advocate who has been working with us for uh, many, many years. And, and there are full patient advocate interest in our center. We also had uh, um, annual meetings. Uh, well, um, the, 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 these are annual NCI visits. Uh, the, uh, the, then the uh, NCI folks will, will come to us to, to see how well we are doing. Um, you know, over, over the year, uh, here's a NAS. Uh, she is uh, the, the, the uh, program officer of the NCI year 54 center. She is the, the associate uh, director of the division of cancer biology now. And uh, this is Dan, uh, uh, he's the boss. Uh, he's the director of the division for cancer biology. So during these uh, NCI side visit, we, we make a scientific pro, uh, presentations. We, uh, we provide our annual report and we, we talked about the uh, future uh, directions. For, for this center and for cancer large. Now, with the, with the help of this center grant, we have been working very hard to uh, make sure that uh, the, the projects are on track. Now, here, here's one example we, where we found that the certain genes um, are responsible for the migration properties of, uh, of the dendritic cell. In this case, we found the neck out of this gene with a CRISPR-Cas9 would uh, make the dendritic cells uh, uptake more particles and uh, accumulate more in the uh, uh, lymph node, which uh, bodes well with uh, the vaccine activity. Here's uh, another study where we, we test different uh, nano and micro particles with different size, shape, and surface properties. And we found that there's a nice correlation between DC uptake and the severity of these particles. And um, since the uh, dangerous cell vaccine, it, although it's a, a personalized therapy for the cancer patient, we found that it's still very inconvenient because uh, in order to pre prepare dendritic cell vaccine, you need to isolate the dendritic cells from that patient. You, you need to do 
GMP uh, amplification of the dendritic cells before you, you, you prepare uh, the, the final dendritic cell work. So over the years, we have been trying our best to uh, do, uh, prepare vaccines without a dendritic cell. So we, we have finally found a, a one uh, nano vac uh, platform where um, the, uh, uh, these particles can be effectively taken up by the dendritic cells. Not only the dendritic cells will carry them to the journal popliteal lymph node, but also to the distant lymph node. Here, the, the green ones are uh, the, uh, the dendritic uh, uh, cells uh, with uh, the uh, fluorescent la labeled vaccine particle. In control, if, if you, you just use a, a liposome to pack the vaccine to prepare uh, nipple vax, we found that uh, um, uh, still um, uh, lots of vaccine particles could be um, carried over to the uh, draining lymph node, but not to the distant lymph node. We use the platform to treat the uh, uh, um, lung metastatic melanoma. Here the treatment state schedule, and here, here are the um, immunostaining of the lung metastatic uh, melanoma. The, the, uh, these are uh, the, the dense areas are the tumor nodules and the, the uh, brown ones um, are the T cell. As you can see, without treatment, there are not uh, many T cells there. With the nano vaccine treatment, there are lots of T cells. Now, yeah, if, if you just use uh, a microparticle with, uh, with the antigen, you improve somewhat, but not as, as, as efficiently as the nano vaccine. And then we have uh, uh, compared our nano vaccine with the alum, which is a um, particulate vaccine that has been uh, applied in um, the uh, antibody production. So alum did, uh, did not do much. Even alone with our new, uh, newly uh, identified vaccine that was included in the Nanovax, it improved a, a little bit, but uh, based on the survival, it's minimal. While uh, if you treat it with our uh, nano vaccine, you, we can significantly improve the animal survival. We have also compared our nano vaccine with uh, a poly IC LC based uh, peptide vaccine. Now, poly-ICLC uh, um, is an FDA-approved uh, vaccine adjuvant, and it has been widely used in, in clinical trials for peptide vaccine. Uh, for, for that, for Catherine Wu uh, and her colleagues have uh, uh, asked, uh, have uh, applied the poly-ICLC uh, to prepare uh, peptide vaccines and apply it to treat the melanoma patients and uh, 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 glioblastoma. But with a, a certain success, uh, we found that our nano vaccine worked much, much better than, than the poly ICLC based vaccine. You know? So, which is, uh, uh, is a, a nice validation to show that uh, we, uh, uh, our vaccine is uh, very efficacious. Not only melanoma, because um, there's a general belief that the melanoma is kind of uh, easy to treat, although it's not so easy. Uh, 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 because uh, you have the anti-CTL1 antibodies and anti-PD1 antibodies. We have also applied the same system to, to treat the solid tumor. In this case, it's a breast cancer. Um, it's a HER2 positive breast cancer. Uh, without vaccine treatment, there are certain T cells, but they're very sparse. With the nano vax treatment, the, you can see um, the, um, the, the density of the uh, T cells were uh, much higher, and uh, um, uh, uh, so, uh, a certain percentage of T cells were actually anti specific, HER2 specific T cells. And uh, this is the uh, growth curve from um, a primary HER2 positive uh, breast cancer model. Uh, without treatment, the, the tumors grow very fast, and with the nano vax treatment, there was uh, a significant uh, slowdown on tumor growth. Here's a, a, a second model with a, with a metastatic breast cancer to, to multiple areas. In, in this case, uh, we 
we inoculate the, the tumor cells by intracardiac injection. These animals develop not only lung metastasis, but also brain metastasis and uh, 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 regional lymph node metastasis. Um, uh, well, um, in our uh, case, we found that uh, we can significantly improve the survival of these animals. This is still an ongoing experiment. We will, will be interesting, uh, interested to see whether these animals can, can um, survive much, much longer from here. And um, also we have applied the, the uh, uh, nano vaccine with a different antigen to treat the colorectal cancer. In this case, it's a CT26 uh, colorectal cancer. CT26 uh, uh, tumors are uh, resistant to the current antibody treatment, resistant to PD-1, PD-L1, resistant to uh, anti-PTL4. Uh, here we, we have shown a, a significant um, or dramatic reduction of tumor growth. Again, we have the poly ICLC uh, based uh, antigen peptide vaccine as a control, showing that our nano vaccine worked much better. Okay. So with the success of the tumor treatment, we also noticed the, the certain, uh, certain issues. For example, in this case, it, it's a liver metastatic nodule. We found that, uh, that our uh, vaccine treatment actually completely wiped out the, the tumor cells in the nodule. However, uh, in the same area that uh, the, the, um, the uh, tissue uh, developed the fibrosis. So, uh, but the fibrosis is also a big problem. Uh, so uh, as, as you know, in, in, the, uh, in the clinic, well, in our cancer center, for example, patients uh, are routinely treated with radiation. Uh, after radi for example, patients with head and neck cancer, after uh, radiation treatment, they, they often develop a fibrosis. They, so a certain patients, they, they, they have a, a difficulty in, in turning, turning their head. So, uh, fibrosis is also a big, big problem. So uh, now we have uh, initiated uh, uh, a study to see whether we can in, uh, 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 prevent the fibrosis while in the meantime curing the tumor. And I think uh, uh, in this area, uh, there are lots of uh, uh, looms for, for future uh, collaboration. Well, um, this is the last platform. Uh, this, uh, well, um, we, we have also developed a, a liposome-based platform uh, for, for mRNA vaccine. As you know, uh, mRNA vaccine uh, has a certain advantage over uh, the, the other uh, type of vaccines. And there are multiple companies working on mRNA vaccine, like Moderna, like uh, BioNTech. I think uh, in the COVID-19 vaccine program, there are also several mRNA vaccine platforms there. So we, we developed this platform in, back in uh, 2017 and a company licensed the, the platform uh, for, for cancer vaccine, uh, personalized cancer vaccine development. As you can see, uh, they, uh, this is the best baseline of uh, a metastatic tumor. Uh, after two cycles of treatment, the, the tumor size got shrink. Uh, and after four cycles treatment, there's even better um, result. And uh, uh, the same uh, platform has also been used to develop a, a COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, here is the treatment schedule and uh, here is uh, result. Uh, uh, in, in this case, these animals were first uh, vaccinated. Uh, and, and then uh, uh, two weeks after the vaccination, the animals uh, uh, were challenged with the COVID-19 virus. In, in the mock uh, uh, treatment, the, uh, the lung tissues were, were uh, very inf inflamed. Uh, you know, uh, if you uh, treat animals with a low dose vaccine, you you see a big big improvement. With high dose vaccine, um, the uh, there was almost uh, no information there, which uh, 
uh, uh, uh, both well for the vaccine uh, if they just enter the, the clinical trial last week. Now, well, uh, we, uh, I've uh, uh, gone through several platforms, but if we, we take a look of, of the tumor tissue, you know, here uh, is a cartoon, uh, we have the uh, blood vessels, tumor blood vessels and the, the, the tumor tissues. If we take an overall look of the tumor, there you have the tumor cells, you, you also have a constant infiltration of myeloid that derive the cell, the monocytes, the macrophages, and the, the neutrophils. And the, these cells actually constitute a, an immune suppressive environment uh, that prevent the uh, uh, cancer treatment uh, and also contribute to uh, therapy resistance. So my group have also been working on um, uh, several projects in this area. I have, uh, I have uh, uh, two R1 grants in, in this area and I have two pending R1 applications uh, targeting different uh, cells or or applying cells uh, as the delivery vehicles for the therapeutic agents. Uh, uh, well, he, here's a lab. Um, so I usually maintain a lab of 12 to uh, 15 people. Some, sometimes it can uh, be up to 20. Here, here's a, a picture we showed a couple of years ago. And uh, I've been working very closely with uh, Mauro Ferrari, uh, who used to be the uh, CEO of our, our institute. Uh, uh, he is currently um, a professor in University of Washington School of Pharmacy. I also work uh, very closely with Su Xia Chen. Uh, by the way, I'm the leader of our um, the Innovative Therapeutics Program in Massachusetts Cancer Center. So I work very closely with uh, the, the clinicians in our cancer center. Here yeah, the, um, uh, the researchers in the U54 program. Uh, not only um, research, but we have, uh, also have education and outreach. Uh, 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 Professor Joy Wolfram um, in, in Mayo Clinic is uh, uh, chairing our education program. And here are this, uh, some of the funding support, as I mentioned, we have the U54 center grant the two hour one projects uh, that uh, I did not touch. The, uh, the, the DOD project was funded for the product development. And then we have also have a, a couple of uh, companies sponsor the research program. And I will stop here. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Um, uh, I know there are uh, ways in which one can ask a question. There's a couple of ways you can, um, probably the easiest way if you um, use the Q&A uh, chat. So we have time for a few questions. Um, and the first one is just about um, if you can comment on some things related to the effect of nanoparticle size and shape on, what it, on how they affect the biological barriers and drug penetration into the tumor cells. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Well, uh, I think uh, the size shape is actually a, a, a uh, these these are very important parameters for the uh, transport of the nanoparticles uh, because uh, in order to to reach the uh, tumor tissue, uh, first these nanoparticles need to to go to the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, tumor blood vessel uh, area, right? If if they they do not carry the the right surface property, and and a lot of these particles will be trapped before they they reach the, the tumor blood vessel. Uh, so um, over the years, we have uh, developed the algorithms uh, to make sure that the the, the nan, uh, nano, certain nanoparticles and especially the microparticles, since they are big, they need to, to uh, work in sync with uh, the fluid uh, hydrodynamics so that they, they can go with the blood flow in a normal blood vessel, but they, they will have to stay uh, in the tumor blood vessel there where the vessels are treacherous and with uh, uh, many uh, branches which create uh, tuberance there. 
So, uh, wonderful. I guess um, yeah, thank sorry, you. Sorry, I, I was on mute. Um, I have a baby here, so I want to make sure I don't um, have background noise. Um, <laughs> so, if you can um, also um, talk about how the uh, the nanoparticle and the drug um, can identify the tumor cells and do, do you use biomarkers or other things to um, kind of um, enable that? Yeah, uh, thank you. Well, yeah, the, the nanoparticles and the tumor cells, nanoparticles, they, they need to interact with the tumor cells or, or, or even uh, the, the drug molecule, they need to, to enter the, the, the tumor cells. So we, uh, over the years, we have uh, done, done several uh, things. So uh, I, th I think um, after the, uh, the, the particle have reached the tumor tissue, they, the nanoparticles, they need to, to find the tumor cell. Uh, there, there are several ways to do that. One, um, well, uh, uh, this is something that I did not talk, uh, but, but covered by one of my our own projects. We can ask the uh, the myelot, especially the uh, the neutrophils, to to carry the nanoparticles to uh, next to the tumor uh, cell. As we know that the, these neutrophils are very short lived. Uh, usually, the the half life is is, is only only a few. Uh, uh, um, hours, uh, six to eight hours. So, so they uh, they are going to die inside the uh, tumor tissue anyway. When once they die, they can release the the drug molecules to to feed the, the tumor cell. Now, in other uh, uh, times, uh, for example, when we were talking uh, targeting uh, these cancer stem cells, uh, we know that the cancer stem cells uh, they. Uh, um, in the case of breast, uh, breast cancer stem cell, they, they tend to uh, express the CD44 surface marker. So, so we, we, can, we can use the, the, the CD44 as a targeting moiety to, to get them. Still, uh, in, in other uh, cases, we, uh, in, in the case of uh, polymeric uh, Dr. Robertson, in, in I'm PGP doctor. We did not uh, uh, use any targeting moiety on the surface of uh, of the PDOX. And that this is because in in the polymeric doxorubicin, the polymer is made of glutamic acid, and, uh, and we know that the the, the uh, tumor cells they they like uh, uh, aspartic acid and glutamic acid, even if these uh, amino acid residues uh, were conjugated in the polymer, the, cell, the tumor cells still ha uh, have the tendency to preferentially um, take them up. So I, I think there, there are several ways to do that, to, to make the tumor cells to, to uh, take up the uh, drug molecules. Wonderful. Uh, well, I know we've actually um, have run a few minutes um, over time, so I want to make sure that everyone uh, stays on their schedule because this is at least in uh, West Coast is 9 a.m. and I know some people have meetings coming up. So um, again, thank you Haifa very, very much for this uh, very wonderful presentation um, and um, look forward to hearing back a lot more about the great stuff that's happening. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, uh, thank you. The, uh, Dr. Kadam Hussein for the opportunity. Uh, well, I enjoy uh, the, the event. Thank you. I look forward to meeting with the, the guys on the West Coast. Lovely. And thank you everyone for joining. Um, hopefully we'll see you all very soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.